Part One of American Cookery by Amelia Simmons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betsy Bush in Marquette, Michigan, July 2010. American Cookery, or the Art of Dressing Viands, Fish, Poultry, and Vegetables, and the Best Modes of Making Pastes, Puffs, Pies, Tarts, Puddings, Custards, and Preserves, and All Kinds of Cakes, from the Imperial Plum to Plain Cake, Adapted to This Country and All Grades of Life, by Amelia Simmons, an American Orphan, published according to Act of Congress, Hartford, printed by Hudson and Goodwin, for the author, 1796. Preface. As this treatise is calculated for the improvement of the rising generation of females in America, the lady of fashion and fortune will not be displeased, if many hints are suggested for the more general and universal knowledge of those females in this country, who, by the loss of their parents, or other unfortunate circumstances, are reduced to the necessity of going into families in the line of domestics, or taking refuge with their friends or relations, and doing those things which are really essential to the perfecting them as good wives and useful members of society. The orphan, though left to the care of virtuous guardians, will find it essentially necessary to have an opinion and determination of her own. The world and the fashion thereof is so variable that old people cannot accommodate themselves to the various changes and fashions which daily occur. They will adhere to the fashion of their day, and will not surrender their attachments to the good old way, while the young and the gay bend and conform readily to the taste of the times and fancy of the hour. By having an opinion and determination, I would not be understood to mean an obstinate perseverance in trifles, which borders on obstinacy, by no means, but only an adherence to those rules and maxims which have flood the test of ages, and will forever establish the female character, a virtuous character, although they conform to the ruling taste of the age in cookery, dress, language, manners, etc. It must ever remain a check upon the poor solitary orphan, that while those females who have parents or brothers or riches to defend their indiscretions, that the orphan must depend solely upon character. How immensely important, therefore, that every action, every word, every thought, be regulated by the strictest purity, and that every movement meet the approbation of the good and wise. The candor of the American ladies is solicitously entreated by the authoress, as she is circumscribed in her knowledge, this being an original work in this country. Should any future additions appear, she hopes to render it more valuable. Directions for Catering, or the Procuring the Best Viands, Fish, etc. How to Choose Flesh Beef the large, stall-fed ox-beef is the best. It has a coarse open grain and oily smoothness. Dent it with your finger and it will immediately rise again. If old, it will be rough and spongy and the dent remain. Cow-beef is less boned and generally more tender and juicy than the ox in America, which is used to labor. Of almost every species of animals, birds, and fishes, the female is the tenderest, the richest flavored, and among poultry the soonest fattened. Mutton. Grass-fed is good two or three years old. Lamb. If under six months, is rich, and no danger of imposition. It may be known by its size in distinguishing either. Veal is soon lost. Great care, therefore, is necessary in purchasing. Veal brought to market in panniers or in carriages is to be preferred to that brought in bags and flouncing on a sweaty horse. Pork is known by its size, and whether properly fattened by its appearance. To make the best bacon. To each ham put one ounce saltpetre, one pint bay salt, one pint molasses. Shake together six or eight weeks, or when a large quantity is together. Baste them with the liquor every day. When taken out to dry, smoke three weeks with cobs or malt fumes. To every ham may be added a cheek. If you stow away a barrel and not alter the composition, some add a shoulder. For transportation or exportation, double the period of smoking. Fish. How to choose the best in market. Salmon. The noblest and richest fish taken in fresh water. The largest are the best. 
They are unlike almost every other fish, are ameliorated by being three or four days out of water, if kept from heat in the moon, which has much more injurious effect than the sun. In all great fish markets, great fishmongers strictly examine the gills. If the bright redness is exchanged for a low brown, they are stale. But when live fish are brought flouncing into market, you have only to elect the kind most agreeable to your palate and the season. Shad. Contrary to the generally received opinion, are not so much richer flavored, as they are harder when first taken out of the water. Opinions vary respecting them. I have tasted shad thirty or forty miles from the place where caught, and really conceived that they had a richness of flavor which did not appertain to those taken fresh and cooked immediately, and have proved both at the same table, and the truth may rest here, that a shad thirty-six or forty-eight hours out of water may not cook so hard and solid, and be esteemed so elegant, yet give a higher relished flavor to the taste. Every species generally of salt-water fish are best fresh from the water, though the Hannah Hill, blackfish, lobster, oyster, flounder, bass, cod, haddock, and eel, with many others, may be transported by land many miles, find a good market, and retain a good relish. But as generally live ones are bought first, deceits are used to give them a freshness of appearance, such as peppering the gills, wetting the fins and tails, and even painting the gills, or wetting with animal blood. Experience and attention will dictate the choice of the best. Fresh gills, full bright eyes, moist fins and tails, are denotements of their being fresh caught. If they are soft, it's certain they are stale. But if deceits are used, their smell must approve or denounce them, and be your safest guide. Of all freshwater fish, there are none that require, or so well afford haste in cookery, as the salmon trout. They are best when caught under a fall or cataract, from what philosophical circumstance is yet unsettled, yet true it is, that at the foot of a fall the waters are much colder than at the head. Trout choose those waters. If taken from them and hurried into dress, they are genuinely good, and take rank in point of superiority of flavor of most other fish. Perch and roach are noble panfish. The deeper the water from whence taken, the finer are their flavors. If taken from shallow water, with muddy bottoms, they are impregnated therewith, and are unsavory. Eels, though taken from muddy bottoms, are best to jump in the pan. Most white or soft fish are best bloated, which is done by salting and peppering, and drying in the sun and in a chimney. After thirty or forty hours drying, are best broiled, and moistened with butter, etc. Poultry, how to choose. Having before stated that the female in almost every instance is preferable to the male, and peculiarly so in the peacock, which, though beautifully plumaged, is tough, hard, stringy, and untasted, and even indelicious, while the peahen is exactly otherwise, and the queen of all birds. So also, in a degree, turkey. Hen turkey is higher and richer flavored, easier fattened, and plumper. They are no odds in market." Dunghill fowls are, from their frequent use, a tolerable proof of the former birds. Chickens, of either kind, are good, and the yellow-legged the best, and their taste the sweetest. Capons, if young, are good, are known by short spurs and smooth legs. All birds are known, whether fresh-killed or stale, by a tight vent in the former, and a loose open vent, if old or stale. Their smell denotes their goodness. Speckled rough legs denote age, while smooth legs and combs prove them young. A goose, if young, the bill will be yellow, and will have but few hairs. The bones will crack easily, but if old the contrary, the bill will be red and the pads still redder, the joints stiff and difficultly disjointed, if young otherwise. Choose one not very fleshy on the breast, but fat in the rump. Ducks are similar to geese. Wild ducks have redder pads and smaller than the tame ones, otherwise are like the goose or tame duck, or to be chosen by the same rules. Woodcocks ought to be thick, fat, and flesh firm, the nose dry, and throat clear. Snipes, if young and fat, have full veins under the wing, and are small in the veins, otherwise like the woodcock. 
Partridges, if young, will have black bills, yellowish legs. If old, the legs look bluish. If old or stale, it may be perceived by smelling at their mouths. Pigeons, young, have light red legs and the flesh of a color, and prick easily. Old have red legs, blackish in parts, more hairs, plumper and loose vents. So also of gray or green plover, blade birds, thrash, lark, and wild fowl in general. Hares are white fleshed and flexible when new and fresh killed. If stale, their flesh will have a blackish hue, like old pigeons, and if the cleft in their lip spread much, is wide and ragged, she is old, the contrary when young. Leveret is like the hare in every respect, that some are obliged to search for the knob or small bone on the foreleg or foot to distinguish them. Rabbits, the wild are the best, either are good and tender. If old, there will be much yellowish fat about the kidneys, the claws long, wool rough, and mixed with gray hairs. If young, the reverse. As to their being fresh, judge by the scent. They soon perish, if trapped or shot, and left in pelt or undressed. Their taint is quicker than veal, and the most sickish in nature, and will not, like beef or veal, be purged by fire. The cultivation of rabbits would be profitable in America if the best methods were pursued. They are a very prolific and profitable animal. They are easily cultivated if properly attended, but not otherwise. A rabbit's burrow, on which three thousand dollars may have been expended, might be very profitable, but on the small scale they would be well near market towns, easier bred and more valuable. Butter Tight, waxy, yellow butter is better than white or crumbly, which soon becomes rancid and frowy. Go into the center of balls or rolls to prove and judge it. If in firkin, the middle is to be preferred, as the sides are frequently distasted by the wood of the firkin, although oak and used for years. New pine tubs are ruinous to the butter. To have sweet butter in dog days and through the vegetable seasons, send stone pots to honest, neat, and trusty dairy people, and procure it packed down in May, and let them be brought in in the night or cool rainy morning, covered with a clean cloth, wet in cold water, and partake of no heat from the horse, and set the pots in the coldest part of your cellar, or in the ice-house. Some say that May butter thus preserved will go into the winter use, better than fall-made butter. Cheese. The red, smooth, moist-coated, and tight-pressed, square-edged cheese, are better than white coat, hard-rinded, or bilged. The inside should be yellow and flavored to your taste. Old shelves, which have only been wiped down for years, are preferable to scoured and washed shelves. Deceits are used by saltpetering the outside, or coloring with hemlock, cocumberries, or saffron, infused into the milk. The taste of either supersedes every possible evasion. Eggs. Clear, thin-shelled, longest oval and sharp edges are best. To ascertain whether new or stale, hold to the light. If the white is clear, the yolk regularly in the center, they are good, but if otherwise they are stale. The best possible method of ascertaining is to put them into water. If they lie on their bilge, they are good and fresh. If they bob up on an end, they are stale, and if they rise, they are addled, proved, and of no use. End of Part 1 of American Cookery by Amelia Simmons Part 2 of American Cookery by Amelia Simmons This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. We proceed to roots and vegetables, and the best cook cannot alter the first quality, they must be good, or the cook will be disappointed. Potatoes take rank for universal use, profit, and easy acquirement. The smooth skin, known by the name of house potato, is the most mealy and richest flavored, the yellow rusticoat next best. The red and the red rusticoat are tolerable, and the yellow Spanish have their value. Those cultivated from imported seed on sandy or dry loamy lands are best for table use, though the red or either will produce more in rich, loamy, highly manured garden grounds. New lands in a sandy soil afford the richest flavored. 
and most mealy potato much depends on the ground on which they grow, more on the species of potatoes planted, and still more from foreign seeds. And each may be known by attention to connoisseurs, for a good potato comes up in many branches of cookery, as herein after prescribed. All potatoes should be dug before the rainy seasons in the fall, well dried in the sun, kept from frost and dampness during the winter. In the spring removed from the cellar to a dry loft and spread thin, and frequently stirred and dried, or they will grow and be thereby injured for cookery. A roast potato is brought on with roast beef, a steak, a chop, or fricassee. Good boiled with a boiled dish. Make an excellent stuffing for a turkey, water, or wild fowl. Make good pie, and a good starch for many uses. All potatoes run out, or depreciate in America. A fresh importation of the Spanish might restore them to table use. It would swell this treatise too much to say everything that is useful to prepare a good table, but I may be pardoned by observing that the Irish have preserved a genuine mealy-rich potato for a century which takes rank of any known in any other kingdom, and I have heard that they renew their seed by planting and cultivating the seed-ball which grows on the tine. The manner of their managing it to keep up the excellency of that root would better suit a treatise on agriculture and gardening than this, and be inserted in a book which would be read by the farmer instead of his amiable daughter. If no one treats on the subject, it may appear in the next edition. Onions The Madeira white is best in market, a steamed softer flavored, and not so fiery, but the high red, round, hard onions are the best. If you consult cheapness, the largest are best. If you consult taste and softness, the very smallest are the most delicate, and used at the first tables. Onions grow in the richest, highest cultivated ground, and better and better, year after year, on the same ground. Beets grow on any ground, but best on loam, or light gravel grounds. The red is the richest and best approved. The white has a sickish sweetness which is disliked by many. Parsnips are a valuable root, cultivated best in rich old grounds and doubly deep ploughed, late sown, they grow thrifty, and are not so prongy. They may be kept anywhere and anyhow, so that they do not grow with heat, or are nipped with frost. If frosted, let them thaw in earth. They are richer flavored when ploughed out of the ground in April, having stood out during the winter, though they will not last long after and commonly more sticky and hard in the center. Carrots are managed, as it respects ploughing and rich ground, similarly to parsnips. The yellow are better than the orange or red. Middling sized, that is, a foot long and two inches thick at the top end, are better than overgrown ones. They are cultivated best with onions, sowed very thin and mixed with other seeds, while young or six weeks after sown, especially if with onions on true onion ground. They are good with veal cookery, rich in soups, excellent with hash, in May and June. Garlics, though used by the French, are better adapted to the uses of medicine than cookery. Asparagus. The mode of cultivation belongs to gardening. Their business is only to cut and dress. The largest is best. The growth of a day sufficient, six inches long, and cut just above the ground, Many cut below the surface, under an idea of getting tender shoots, and preserving the bed, but it enfeebles the root. Dig round it, and it will be wet with the juices, but if cut above ground and just as the dew is going off, the sun will either reduce the juice or send it back to nourish the root. It's an excellent vegetable. Parsley, of the three kinds, the thickest and branchiest is the best, is sown among onions or in a bed by itself may be dried for winter use, though a method which I have experienced is much better. In September I dig my roots, procure an old thin stave dry cask, bore holes an inch diameter in every stave, six inches asunder round the cask, and up to the top. First take a half bushel of rich garden mold, and put into the cask. Then run the roots through the staves, leaving the branches outside. Press the earth tight about the root within, and thus continue on through the respective stories, till the cask is full. It being filled, run an iron bar through the center of the dirt in the cask and fill with water. 
let stand on the south and east side of a building till frosty night, then remove it by slinging a rope round the cask into the cellar, where, during the winter, I clip with my scissors the fresh parsley, which my neighbors or myself have occasion for, and in the spring transplant the roots in the bed in the garden, or in any unused corner, or let stand upon the wharf or the wash-shed. It's an useful mode of cultivation, and a pleasurably tasted herb, and much used in garnishing viands. Radish. Salmon-colored is the best, purple next best, white turnip. Each are procured from southern seeds annually. They grow thriftiest sown among onions. The turnip radish will last well through the winter. Artichokes. The Jerusalem is best, are cultivated like potatoes, though their stalks grow seven feet high, and may be preserved like the turnip radish, or pickled, they like. Horse radish. Once in the garden can scarcely ever be totally eradicated. Plowing or digging them up with that view seems at times rather to increase and spread them. Cucumbers are of many kinds. The prickly is best for pickles, but generally bitter. The white is difficult to raise and tender. Choose the bright green, smooth, and proper sized. Melons. The watermelons is cultivated on sandy soils only. Above latitude forty-one and a half, if a stratum of land be dug from a well, it will bring the first year good watermelons. The red cord are highest flavored. A hard rind proves them ripe. Musk melons are various. The rough skinned are best to eat. The short round, fair skinned, is best for mangoes. Lettuce is of various kinds. The purple spotted leaf is generally the tenderest, and free from bitter. Your taste must guide your market. Cabbage requires a page. They are so multiferous. Note, all cabbages have a higher relish that grow on new, unmatured grounds. If grown in an old town and on old gardens, they have a rankness, which at times may be perceived by a fresh-air traveler. This observation has been experienced for years, that cabbages require new ground, more than turnips. The low Dutch only will do in old gardens. The early Yorkshire must have rich soils. They will not answer for winter. They are easily cultivated and frequently brought to market in the fall, but will not last the winter. The green Savoy, with the richest crinkles, is fine and tender, and although they do not head like the Dutch or Yorkshire, yet the tenderness of the out-leaves is a counterpose. It will last through the winter and are high-flavored. The yellow Savoy takes next rank, but will not last so long. All cabbages will mix and participate of other species, like Indian corn, they are called best in plants, and a true gardener will, in the plant, describe those which will head, and which will not. This is new, but a fact. The gradations in the Savoy cabbage are discerned by the leaf. The richest and most scalloped and crinkled and thickest green Savoy falls little short of a cauliflower. The red and reddest small tight heads are best for slaw. It will not boil well, comes out black or blue, and tinges other things with which it is boiled. Beans. The clabbered bean is easiest cultivated and collected, are good for string beans, will shell, must be polled. The Windsor bean is an earlier good string or shell bean. Cranberry bean is rich but not universally approved equal to the other two. Frost bean is good only to shell. Six weeks bean is a yellowish bean, and early brought forward and tolerable. Lazy bean is tough and needs no pole. English bean, what they denominate the horse bean, is mealy when young, is profitable, easily cultivated, and may be grown on worn-out grounds. As they may be raised by boys, I cannot but recommend the most extensive cultivation of them. The small white bean is best for winter use and excellent. Calivants are run out, a yellow small bush, a black speck or eye, are tough and tasteless, and little worth in cookery, and scarcely bear exportation. Peas, green peas. The crown imperial takes rank in point of flavor. They blossom purple and white on the top of the vines, will run from three to five feet high, should be set in light sandy soil only, or they run too much to vines. The crowned pea is second in richness of flavor. The rendezvous is large and bitterish. 
Early Carlton is produced first in the season. Good. Marrow fats, green, yellow, and is large, easily cultivated, not equal to others. Sugar pea needs no bush. The pods are tender and good to eat, easily cultivated. Spanish manreto is a rich pea, requires a strong high bush. All peas must be picked carefully from the vines as soon as dew is off, shelled and cleaned without water, and boiled immediately. They are thus the richest flavored. Herbs useful in cookery. Thyme is good in soups and stuffings. Sweet marjoram is used in turkeys. Summer savory, ditto, and in sausages and salted beef and legs of pork. Sage is used in cheese and pork, but not generally approved. Parsley, good in soups, and to garnish roast beef, excellent with bread and butter in the spring. Pennyroyal is a high aromatic, although a spontaneous herb in old ploughed fields, yet might be more generally cultivated in gardens and used in cookery and medicines. Sweet thyme is most useful and best approved in cookery. Fruits Pears. There are many different kinds, but the large bell pear, sometimes called the pound pear, the yellowest is the best, and in the same town they differ essentially. Hard winter pear are innumerable in their qualities, are good in sauces and baked. Harvest and summer pear are a tolerable dessert and are much improved in this country, as all other fruits are by grafting and inoculation. Apples are still more various, yet rigidly retain their own species, and are highly useful in families, and ought to be more universally cultivated, excepting in the compactest cities. There is not a single family but might set a tree in some otherwise useless spot, which might serve the twofold use of shade and fruit, on which twelve or fourteen kinds of fruit trees might easily be engrafted, and essentially preserve the orchard from the intrusions of boys, etc., which is too common in America. If the boy who thus planted a tree, and guarded and protected it in a useless corner, and carefully engrafted different fruits, was to be indulged free access into orchards, whilst the neglectful boy was prohibited, how many millions of fruit trees would spring into growth, and what a saving to the Union! The net saving would, in time, extinguish the public debt and enrich our cookery. Currants are easily grown from shoots trimmed off from old bunches, and set carelessly in the ground. They flourish on all soils, and make good jellies. Their cultivation ought to be encouraged. Black currants may be cultivated, but until they can be dried and until sugars are propagated, they are in a degree unprofitable. Grapes are natural to the climate, grow spontaneously in every state in the Union, and ten degrees north of the line of the Union, the Madeira, Lisbon, and Malaga grapes are cultivated in gardens in this country, and are a rich treat or dessert. Trifling attention only is necessary for their ample growth. End of Part 2 of American Cookery by Amelia Simmons Part 3 of American Cookery by Amelia Simmons This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Having pointed out the best methods of judging of the qualities of viands, poultry, fish, vegetables, etc., we now present the best approved methods of dressing and cooking them, and to suit all tastes present the following recipes. To Roast Beef The general rules are to have a brisk hot fire, to hang down rather than to spit, to baste with salt and water, and one quarter of an hour to every pound of beef though tender beef will require less, while old tough beef will require more roasting. Pricking with a fork will determine you whether done or not. Rare done is the healthiest and the taste of this age. Roast Mutton If a breast, let it be called. If a leg, stuffed or not. Let be done more gently than beef, and done more. The chine, saddle, or leg require more fire and longer time than the breast, etc. Garnish with scraped horseradish, and serve with potatoes, beans, cauliflowers, watercresses, or boiled onions, caper sauce, mashed turnip, or lettuce. Roast Veal As it is more tender than beef or mutton, and easily scorched, paper it, especially the fat parts. Lay at some distance from the fire a while to heat gently, 
baste it well. A fifteen-pound piece requires one hour and a quarter roasting. Garnish with green parsley and sliced lemon. Roast Lamb Lay down to a clear good fire that will not want stirring or altering. Baste with butter, dust on flour, baste with the drippings, and before you take it up add more butter and sprinkle on a little salt and parsley shred fine. Send to table with a nice salad, green peas, fresh beans, or a cauliflower or asparagus. To stuff a turkey. Grate a whole loaf, one quarter of a pound butter, one quarter of a pound salt pork finely chopped, two eggs, a little sweet marjoram, summer savory parsley and sage, pepper and salt, if the pork be not sufficient. Fill the bird and sew up. The same will answer for all wild fowl. Water fowls require onions. The same ingredients stuff a leg of veal, fresh pork, or a loin of veal. To stuff and roast a turkey or fowl. One pound soft wheat bread, three ounces beef suet, three eggs, a little sweet thyme, sweet marjoram, pepper and salt, and some add a gill of wine. Fill the bird therewith and sew up. Hang down to a steady solid fire, basting frequently with salt and water, and roast until a steam emits from the breast. Put one-third of a pound of butter into the gravy, dust flour over the bird, and baste with the gravy. Serve up with boiled onions and cranberry sauce, mangoes, pickles, or celery. 2. Others omit the sweet herbs and add parsley done with potatoes. 3. Boil and mash three pints potatoes, wet them with butter, add sweet herbs, pepper, salt, fill, and roast as above. To stuff and roast a goslin. Boil the innards tender, chop them fine, put double quantity of grated bread, four ounces butter, pepper, salt, and sweet herbs if you like. Two eggs molded into the stuffing, parboil four onions and chop them into the stuffing, add wine and roast the bird. The above is a good stuffing for every kind of waterfowl, which requires onion sauce. To smother a fowl in oysters. Fill the bird with dry oysters and sew up, and boil in water just sufficient to cover the bird. Salt and season to your taste. When done tender, put into a deep dish and pour over it a pint of stewed oysters, well buttered and peppered. Garnish a turkey with sprigs of parsley or leaves of celery. A fowl is best with a parsley sauce. To stuff a leg of veal. Take one pound of veal, half pound pork, salted, one pound grated bread. Chop all very fine, with a handful of green parsley. Pepper it. Add three ounces butter and three eggs, and sweet herbs if you like them. Cut the leg round like a ham, and stab it full of holes, and fill in all the stuffing. Then salt and pepper the leg and dust on some flour. If baked in an oven, put into a saucepan with a little water. If potted, lay some skewers at the bottom of the pot. Put in a little water and lay the leg on the skewers. With a gentle fire, render it tender, frequently adding water. When done, take out the leg, put butter in the pot and brown the leg. The gravy in a separate vessel must be thickened and buttered, and a spoonful of ketchup added. To stuff a leg of pork to bake or roast. Corn the leg forty-eight hours and stuff with sausage meat, and bake in a hot oven two hours and a half or roast. To a la mode a round of beef. To a fourteen or sixteen pound round of beef, put one ounce saltpetre, forty-eight hours after stuff it with the following. One and a half pound beef, one pound salt pork, two pound grated bread, Chop all fine and rub in a half pound butter, salt, pepper, and cayenne, summer savory, thyme. Lay it on skewers in a large pot, over three pints hot water, which it must occasionally be supplied with, the steam of which in four or five hours will render the round tender, if over a moderate fire. When tender, take away the gravy and thicken with flour and butter, and boil. Brown the round with butter and flour, adding ketchup and wine to your taste. To a la mode a round. Take fat pork, cut in slices or mince, season it with pepper, salt, sweet marjoram, and thyme, cloves, mace, and nutmeg. Make holes in the beef and stuff it the night before cooked. 
Put some bones across the bottom of the pot to keep from burning. Put in one quart claret wine, one quart water, and one onion. Lay the round on the bones. Cover close and stop it round the top with dough. Hang on in the morning, and stew gently two hours. Turn it, and stop tight, and stew two hours more. When done tender, grate a crust of bread on the top, and brown it before the fire. Scum the gravy, and serve in a butter boat. Serve it with the residue of the gravy in the dish. To dress a turtle. Fill a boiler or kettle with a quantity of water sufficient to scald the calipash and calipi, the fins, etc., and about nine o'clock hang up your turtle by the hind fins. Cut off the head and save the blood. Take a sharp pointed knife and separate the calipash from the calipi, or the back from the belly part, down to the shoulders, so as to come at the entrails which take out, and clean them, as you would those of any other animal, and throw them into a tub of clean water, taking great care not to break the gall, but to cut it off from the liver and throw it away. Then separate each distinctly, and put the guts into another vessel. Open them with a small penknife, end to end, wash them clean, and draw them through a woolen cloth, in warm water, to clear away the slime, and then put them in clean cold water, till they are used with the other part of the entrails, which must be cut up small to be mixed in the baking dishes with the meat. This done, separate the back and belly pieces, carefully cutting away the four fins by the upper joint which scald. Peel off the loose skin and cut them into small pieces, laying them by themselves, either in another vessel or on the table, ready to be seasoned. Then cut off the meat from the belly part, and clean the back from the lungs, kidneys, etc., and that meat cut into pieces as small as a walnut, laying it likewise by itself. After this you are to scald the back and belly pieces, pulling off the shell from the back, and the yellow skin from the belly, when all will be white and clean, and with the kitchen cleaver cut those up likewise into pieces about the bigness or breadth of a card. Put those pieces into clean cold water, wash them and place them in a heap on the table, so that each part may lay by itself. The meat being thus prepared and laid separate for seasoning, mix two-thirds parts of salt, or rather more, and one-third part of cayenne pepper, black pepper, and nutmeg and mace pounded fine and mixed all together, the quantity to be proportioned to the size of the turtle, so that in each dish there may be about three spoonfuls of seasoning to every twelve pound of meat. Your meat being thus seasoned, get some sweet herbs, such as thyme, savory, etc., let them be dried and rubbed fine, and having provided some deep dishes to bake it in, which should be of the common brown ware, put in the coarsest part of the meat, put a quarter pound of butter at the bottom of each dish, and then put some of each of the several parcels of meat, so that the dishes may be all alike and have equal portions of the different parts of the turtle, and between each laying of meat strew a little of the mixture of sweet herbs, fill your dishes within an inch and a half or two inches of the top, Boil the blood of the turtle and put into it, then lay on force meat balls made of veal, highly seasoned with the same seasoning as the turtle. Put in each dish a gill of Madeira wine, and as much water as it will conveniently hold. Then break over it five or six eggs to keep the meat from scorching at the top, and over that shake a handful of shred parsley to make it look green. When done, put your dishes into an oven made hot enough to bake bread, and in an hour and a half or two hours, according to the size of the dishes, it will be sufficiently done. To dress a calf's head, turtle fashion. The head and feet being well scalded and cleaned, open the head, taking the brains, wash, pick, and cleanse, salt and pepper, and parsley them, and put by in a cloth. Boil the head, feet, and heartslet one and quarter, or one and a half hour. Sever out the bones, cut the skin and meat in slices. Drain the liquor in which boiled, and put by. Clean the pot very clean, or it will burn, too. Make a layer of the slices, which dust with a composition made of black pepper one spoon, of sweet herbs pulverized two spoons, sweet marjoram and thyme are most approved, a teaspoon of cayenne, one pound butter, then dust with flour, then a layer of slices, with slices of veal and seasoning till completed. Cover with the liquor, Stew gently three-quarters of an hour. To make the forced meatballs, take one and half pound veal, one pound grated bread, 
four ounces raw salt pork mince and season with above and work with three whites into balls one or one and a half inch diameter roll in flour and fry in very hot butter till brown then chop the brains fine and stir into the whole mess in the pot put thereto one-third part of the fried balls and a pint wine or less when all is heated through take off and serve in tureens laying the residue of the balls and hard-boiled and peeled eggs into a dish garnish with slices of lemon a stew pie boil a shoulder of veal and cut up salt pepper and butter half pound and slices of raw salt pork make a layer of meat and a layer of biscuit or biscuit dough into a pot cover close and stew half an hour in three quarts of water only a sea pie four pound of flour one and a half pound of butter rolled into paste wet with cold water line the pot therewith lay in split pigeons turkey pies veal mutton or birds with slices of pork salt pepper and dust on flour doing thus until your pot is full or your ingredients expended add three pints water cover tight with paste and stew moderately two and a half hours a chicken pie pick and clean six chickens without scalding take out their innards and wash the birds while whole then joint the birds salt and pepper the pieces and inwards roll one inch thick paste number eight and cover a deep dish and double at the rim or edge of the dish put thereto a layer of chickens and a layer of thin slices of butter till the chickens and one and a half pound butter are expended which cover with a thick paste bake one and a half hour or if your oven be poor parboil the chicken with a half a pound of butter and put the pieces with the remaining one pound of butter and half the gravy into the paste and while boiling thicken the residue of the gravy and when the pie is drawn open the crust and add the gravy minced pies a foot pie scald neat's feet and clean well grass-fed are best put them into a large vessel of cold water which change daily during a week then boil the feet till tender and take away the bones when cold chop fine to every four pound minced meat add one pound of beef suet and four pound apple raw and a little salt chop all together very fine add one quart of wine two pound of stoned raisins one ounce of cinnamon one ounce mace and sweetened to your taste make one of paste number three bake three quarters of an hour weeks after when you have occasion to use them carefully raise the top crust and with a round-edged spoon collect the meat into a basin which warm with additional wine and spices to the taste of your circle while the crust is also warmed like a hoe cake put carefully together and serve up by this means you can have hot pies through the winter and enriched singly to your company tongue pie one pound neat's tongue one pound apple one-third of a pound of sugar one quarter of a pound of butter one pint of wine one pound of raisins or currants or half of each half ounce of cinnamon and mace bake in paste number one in proportion to size minced pie of beef four pound boiled beef chopped fine and salted six pound of raw apple chopped also one pound beef suet one quart of wine or rich sweet cider one ounce mace and cinnamon a nutmeg two pounds raisins bacon paste number three three-fourths of an hour observations all meat pies require a hotter and brisker oven than fruit pies in good cookeries all raisins should be stoned as people differ in their tastes they may alter to their wishes and as it is difficult to ascertain with precision the small articles of spicery every one may relish as they like and suit their taste apple pie stew and strain the apples to every three pints grate the peel of a fresh lemon add cinnamon mace rose water and sugar to your taste and bake in paste number three every species of fruit such as peas plums raspberries blackberries may be only sweetened without spices and bake in paste number three currant pies take green full-grown currants and one-third their quantity of sugar proceeding as above 
a buttered apple pie pair quarter and core tart apples lay in paste number three cover with the same bake half an hour when drawn gently raise the top crust add sugar butter cinnamon mace wine or rose water end of part three of american cookery by amelia simmons Part four of American Cookery by Amelia Simmons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Puddings. A rice pudding. One quarter of a pound rice, a stick of cinnamon, to a quart of milk, stirred often to keep from burning, and boil quick, cool, and add half a nutmeg, four spoons rose water, eight eggs, butter or puff paste a dish, and pour the above composition into it, and bake one and half hour. Number two. Boil six ounces rice in a quart milk on a slow fire till tender. Stir in one pound butter. Interim beat fourteen eggs. Add to the pudding when cold with sugar, salt, rose water, and spices to your taste. Adding raisins or currants. Bake as number one. Number three. Eight spoons rice boiled in a quart's milk. When cooled, add eight eggs six ounces butter wine sugar and spices bake two hours number four boil in water half pound ground rice till soft add two quarts milk and scald cool and add eight eggs six ounces butter one pound raisins salt cinnamon and a small nutmeg bake two hours number five a cheap one half pint rice two quarts milk salt butter allspice put cold into a hot oven bake two and a half hours number six put six ounces rice into water or milk and water let swell or soak tender then boil gently stirring in a little butter when cool stir in a quart cream six or eight eggs well beaten and add cinnamon nutmeg and sugar to your taste bake n b the mode of introducing the ingredients is a material point. In all cases where eggs are mentioned, it is understood to be well beat. Whites and yolks and the spices fine and settled. A nice Indian pudding. Number one. Three pints scalded milk. Seven spoons fine Indian meal. Stir well together while hot. Let stand till cooled. Add seven eggs, half pound raisins, four ounces butter, spice and sugar bake one and half hour number two three pints scalded milk to one pint meal salted cool add two eggs four ounces butter sugar or molasses and spice it will require two and a half hours baking number three salt a pint meal wet with one quart milk sweeten and put into a strong cloth brass or bell metal vessel stone or earthen pot Secure from wet and boil twelve hours. A Sunderland pudding. Whip six eggs, half the whites, take half a nutmeg, one pint cream and a little salt, four spoons fine flour, oil or butter pans, cups or bowls, bake in a quick oven one hour, eat with sweet sauce. A wit pot. Cut half a loaf of bread in dices. Pour thereon two quarts milk, six eggs, rose water, nutmeg, and half pound of sugar. Put into a dish and cover with paste number one. Bake slow one hour. A bread pudding. One pound soft bread or biscuit soaked in one quart milk. Run through a sieve or colander. Add seven eggs, three quarters of a pound sugar, one quarter of a pound butter, nutmeg or cinnamon, one gill rose water, one pound stoned raisins, half pint cream, bake three quarters of an hour, middling oven. A flour pudding. Seven eggs, one quarter of a pound of sugar, and a teaspoon of salt. Beat and put to one quart milk. Five spoons of flour, cinnamon and nutmeg to your taste. Bake half an hour and serve up with sweet sauce. A boiled flour pudding. One quart milk, nine eggs, seven spoons flour, a little salt, put into a strong cloth and boiled three-quarters of an hour. 
A Cream Almond Pudding Boil gently a little mace and half a nutmeg grated in a quart cream. When cool, beat eight yolks and three whites. Strain and mix with one spoon flour, one quarter of a pound almonds. Settled, add one spoon rose water and by degrees the cold cream and beat well together. Wet a thick cloth and flour it and pour in the pudding. Boil hard half an hour. Take out. Pour over it melted butter and sugar. An apple pudding dumpling. Put into paste quartered apples. Lie in a cloth and boil two hours. Serve with sweet sauce. Pears, plums, etc. are done the same way. Potato pudding, baked. Number one. One pound boiled potatoes, one pound sugar, half a pound butter, ten eggs. Number two. One pound boiled potatoes, mashed, three quarters of a pound butter, three gills milk or cream, the juice of one lemon and the peel grated, half a pound sugar, half nutmeg, seven eggs, taking out three whites, two spoons rose water. Apple pudding. One pound apple sifted, one pound sugar, nine eggs, one quarter of a pound butter, one quart sweet cream, one gill rose water a cinnamon, a green lemon peel grated, if sweet apples, add the juice of half a lemon, put on to paste number seven, currants, raisins, and citron some add, but good without them. Carrot Pudding A coffee cup full of boiled and strained carrots, five eggs, two ounces sugar and butter each, cinnamon and rose water to your taste, baked in a deep dish without paste. A crookneck or winter squash pudding. Core, boil, and skin a good squash and bruise it well. Take six large apples, pared, cored, and stewed tender, mixed together. Add six or seven spoonsful of dry bread or biscuit, rendered fine as meal, half pint milk or cream, two spoons of rose water, two ditto wine, five or six eggs, beaten and strained, nutmeg, salt, and sugar to your taste one spoon flour, beat all smartly together, bake. The above is a good recipe for pumpkins, potatoes, or yams, adding more moistening or milk and rose water, and to the two latter a few black or Lisbon currants, or dry hortleberries scattered in will make it better. Pumpkin. Number one. One quart stewed and strained, three pints cream, nine beaten eggs, sugar, mace, nutmeg, and ginger, laid into paste number seven or three, and with a dough spur cross and checker it, and baked in dishes three quarters of an hour. Number two. One quart of milk, one pint pumpkin, four eggs, molasses, allspice, and ginger in a crust. Bake one hour. Orange pudding. Put sixteen yolks with half a pound butter melted. Grate in the rinds of two Seville oranges. Beat in half pound of fine sugar, Add two spoons orange water, two of rose water, one gill of wine, half pint cream, two Naples biscuit or the crumbs of a fine loaf, or roll soaked in cream. Mix all together. Put it into a rich puff paste, which let be double round the edges of the dish. Bake like a custard. A Lemon Pudding 1. Grate the yellow of the peels of three lemons, then take two whole lemons, Roll under your hand on the table till soft, taking care not to burst them. Cut and squeeze them into the grated peels. 2. Take ten ounces soft wheat bread, and put a pint of scalded white wine thereto. Let soak and put to number 1. 3. Beat four whites and eight yolks, and put to above, adding three quarters of a pound of melted butter, which let be very fresh and good one pound fine sugar, beat all together till thoroughly mixed. 4. Lay paste number 7 or 9 on a dish, plate, or saucers, and fill with above composition. 5. Bake near one hour, and when baked, stick on pieces of paste, cut with a jagging iron or a dough spur to your fancy, baked lightly on a floured paper. Garnished thus, they may be served hot or cold. Puff Pastes for Tarts Number 1. Rub one pound of butter into one pound of flour, 
whip two whites and add with cold water and one yolk. Make into paste, roll in, in six or seven times one pound of butter, flouring it each roll. This is good for any small thing. Number two. Rub six pound of butter into fourteen pound of flour. Eight eggs. Add cold water. Make a stiff paste. Number three. To any quantity of flour, rub in three fourths of its weight of butter. Twelve eggs to a peck. Rub in one third or half and roll in the rest. Number four. Into two quarts flour salted and wet stiff with cold water roll in, in nine or ten times one and a half pound of butter. Number five. One pound flour, three fourths of a pound of butter, beat well. Number six. To one pound of flour rub in one fourth of a pound of butter, wet with three eggs and rolled in a half pound of butter. A paste for sweetmeats. Number seven. Rub one third of a pound of butter and one pound of lard into two pounds of flour, wet with four whites well beaten, water to make a paste, roll in the residue of shortening in ten or twelve rollings, bake quick. Number eight. Rub in one and half pound of suet to six pounds of flour and a spoonful of salt, wet with cream, roll in, in six or eight times, two and half pounds of butter, good for a chicken or meat pie. Royal Paste Number 9. Rub half a pound of butter into one pound of flour. Four whites beat to a foam. Add two yolks, two ounces of fine sugar. Roll often. Rubbing one-third and rolling two-thirds of the butter is best. Excellent for tarts and apple cakes. Custards 1. One pint cream sweetened to your taste, warmed hot. Stir in sweet wine till curdled. Grate in cinnamon and nutmeg. 2. Sweeten a quart of milk, add nutmeg, wine, brandy, rose water, and six eggs. Bake in teacups or dishes, or boil in water, taking care that it don't boil into the cups. 3. Put a stick of cinnamon to one quart of milk, boil well, add six eggs, two spoons of rose water, bake. 4. Boiled custard, one pint of cream, two ounces of almonds, two spoons of rose water or orange flower water, some mace. Boil thick, then stir in sweetening, and laid off into china cups and serve up. Rice Custard Boil a little mace, a quartered nutmeg, in a quart of cream. Add rice, well boiled. While boiling, sweeten and flavor with orange or rose water. Putting into cups or dishes, when cooled, set to serve up. A Rich Custard Four eggs beat and put in one quart cream, sweetened to your taste, half a nutmeg and a little cinnamon, baked. A sick bed custard. Scald a quart of milk, sweeten and salt a little. Whip three eggs and stir in. Bake on coals in a pewter vessel. Tarts. Apple tarts. Stew and strain the apples. Add cinnamon, rose water, wine and sugar to your taste. Lay in paste, royal, squeeze thereon orange juice, bake gently. Cranberries, stewed, strained, and sweetened, put into paste number nine and baked gently. Marmalade, laid into paste number one, baked gently. Apricots must be neither pared, cut, or stoned, but put in whole and sugar sifted over them as above. Orange or lemon tart. Take six large lemons, rub them well in salt, put them into salt and water, and let rest two days. Change them daily in fresh water, fourteen days. Then cut slices and mince as fine as you can, and boil them two or three hours till tender. Then take six pippins, pare, quarter, and core them. Boil in one pint fair water till the pippins break. Then put the half of the pippins, with all the liquor to the orange or lemon, and add one pound sugar. Boil all together one quarter of an hour. Put into a galley pot and squeeze thereto a fresh orange, one spoon of which, with a spoon of the pulp of the pippin, laid into a thin royal paste, laid into small shallow pans or saucers, brushed with melted butter, and some superfine sugar sifted thereon, with a gentle baking will be very good. N.B. Pastry pans or saucers must be buttered lightly before the paste is laid on. 
If glass or china be used, have only a top crust. You can garnish with cut paste like a lemon pudding or serve on paste number seven. Gooseberry tart. Lay clean berries and sift over them sugar, then berries and sugar till a deep dish be filled, cover with paste number nine, and bake somewhat more than other tarts. Grapes must be cut in two and stoned and done like a gooseberry. Syllabubs. To make a fine syllabub from the cow. Sweeten a quart of cider with double refined sugar, grate nutmeg into it, then milk your cow into your liquor. When you have thus added what quantity of milk you think proper, pour half a pint or more, in proportion to the quantity of syllabub you make, of the sweetest cream you can get all over it. A whipped syllabub. Take two porringers of cream and one of white wine. Grate in the skin of a lemon. Take the whites of three eggs. Sweeten it to your taste. Then whip it with a whisk. Take off the froth as it rises, and put it into your syllabub glasses or pots, and they are fit for use. To make a fine cream. Take a pint of cream, sweeten it to your palate, grate a little nutmeg, put in a spoonful of orange flower water and rose water, and two spoonfuls of wine. Beat up four eggs and two whites. Stir it all together one way over the fire till it is thick. Have cups ready and pour it in. Lemon cream. Take the juice of four large lemons, half a pint of water, a pound of double refined sugar beaten fine, the whites of seven eggs, and the yolk of one beaten very well. Mix all together, strain it, set it on a gentle fire, stirring it all the while, and skim it clean. Put into it the peel of one lemon when it is very hot, but not to boil. Take out the lemon peel and pour it into china dishes. Raspberry Cream Take a quart of thick sweet cream and boil it two or three wallops. Then take it off the fire and strain some juices of raspberries into it to your taste. Stir it a good while before you put your juice in, that it may be almost cold when you put it to it, and afterwards stir it one way for almost a quarter of an hour, then sweeten it to your taste, and when it is cold you may send it up. Whipped Cream Take a quart of cream and the whites of eight eggs beaten with half a pint of wine. Mix it together and sweeten it to your taste with double refined sugar. You may perfume it, if you please, with musk or amber gum, tied in a rag and steeped a little in the cream. Whip it up with a whisk and a bit of lemon peel tied in the middle of the whisk. Take off the froth with a spoon and put into glasses. A trifle. Fill a dish with biscuit finely broken, rusk, and spiced cake wet with wine, then pour a good boiled custard, not too thick, over the rusk, and put a syllabub over that. Garnish with jelly and flowers. End of Part 4 Part 5 of American Cookery by Amelia Simmons This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Cake Plum Cake Mix one pound currants, one dram nutmeg, mace, and cinnamon each, a little salt, one pound of citron, orange peel candied, and almonds bleached, six pound of flour, well dried, beat twenty-one eggs, and add with one quart new ale yeast, half pint of wine, three half pints of cream and raisins. Plain cake. Nine pound of flour, three pound of sugar, three pound of butter, one quart emptins, one quart milk, nine eggs, one ounce of spice, one gill of rose water, one gill of wine. Another. Three quarters of a pound of sugar, one pound of butter, six eggs worked into one pound of flour. A rich cake. Rub two pound of butter into five pound of flour, add fifteen eggs, not much beaten, one pint of emptins, one pint of wine, knead up stiff like biscuit, cover well and put by and let rise overnight. To two and a half pound raisins add one gill brandy to soak overnight, or if new, half an hour in the morning. Add them with one gill rose water and two and a half pound of loaf sugar, one ounce of cinnamon, work well and bake as loaf cake number one. Potato cake 
boil potatoes, peel and pound them, add yolks of eggs, wine, and melted butter, work with flour into paste, shape as you please, bake and pour over these melted butter, wine and sugar. Johnny Cake or Hoe Cake Scald one pint of milk and put to three pints of Indian meal and half pint of flour. Bake before the fire. Or scald with milk two-thirds of the Indian meal, or wet two-thirds with boiling water, add salt, molasses, and shortening. Work up with cold water pretty stiff, and bake as above. Indian Slapjack One quart of milk, one pint of Indian meal, four eggs, four spoons of flour, little salt, beat together, bake on griddles, or fry in a dry pan, or baked in a pan which has been rubbed with suet, lard, or butter. Loaf Cakes Number 1. Rub six pound of sugar, two pound of lard, three pound of butter into twelve pound of flour. Add eighteen eggs, one quart of milk, two ounces of cinnamon, two small nutmegs, a teacup of coriander seed, each pounded fine and sifted. Add one pint of brandy, half a pint of wine, six pound of stoned raisins, one pound of emptins. First having dried your flour in the oven, dry and roll the sugar fine. Rub your shortening in sugar half an hour. It will render the cake much whiter and lighter. Heat the oven with dry wood for one and a half hours. If large pans be used, it will then require two hours baking, and in proportion for smaller loaves. To frost it, whip six whites during the baking. Add three pound of sifted loaf sugar, and put on thick as it comes hot from the oven. Some return the frosted loaf into the oven. It injures and yellows it. If the frosting be put on immediately, it does best without being returned into the oven. Another, number two. Rub four pound of sugar, three and a half pound of shortening, half butter and half lard, into nine pound of flour, one dozen of eggs, two ounces of cinnamon, one pint of milk, three spoonfuls coriander seed, three gills of brandy, one gill of wine, three gills of emptins, four pounds of raisins. Another, number three, six pound of flour, three of sugar, two and a half pound of shortening, half butter, half lard, six eggs, one nutmeg, one ounce of cinnamon, and one ounce of coriander seed, one pint of emptins, two gills brandy, one pint of milk, and three pounds of raisins. Another. Number four. Five pound of flour, two pound of butter, two and a half pounds of loaf sugar, two and a half pounds of raisins, fifteen eggs, one pint of wine, one pint of emptins, one ounce of cinnamon, one gill rose water, one gill of brandy, baked like number one. Another plain cake. Number five. Two quarts milk, three pound of sugar, three pound of shortening, warmed hot. Add a quart of sweet cider, this curdle. Add eighteen eggs, allspice and orange to your taste, or fennel, caraway, or coriander seeds. Put to nine pounds of flour, three pints emptins, and bake well. Cookies. One pound sugar boiled slowly in half pint water. Scum well and cool. Add two teaspoons pearl ash dissolved in milk. Then two and a half pounds flour. Rub in four ounces butter and two large spoons of finely powdered coriander seed, wet with above. Make rolls half an inch thick and cut to the shape you please. Bake fifteen or twenty minutes in a slack oven. Good three weeks. Another Christmas Cookie To three pound flour sprinkle a teacup of fine powdered coriander seed. Rub in one pound butter and one and half pound sugar. Dissolve three teaspoonfuls of pearl ash in a teacup of milk. Knead all together well. Roll three quarters of an inch thick and cut or stamp into shape and size you please. Bake slowly fifteen or twenty minutes. Though hard and dry at first, if put into an earthen pot and dry cellar or damp room, they will be finer, softer, and better when six months old. Molasses Gingerbread 
one tablespoon of cinnamon, some coriander or allspice, put to four teaspoons pearl ash, dissolved in half pint water, four pound flour, one quart molasses, four ounces butter, if in summer rub in the butter, if in winter warm the butter and molasses and pour it to the spiced flour. Knead well till stiff, the more the better, the lighter and whiter it will be. Bake brisk fifteen minutes, don't scorch. Before it is put in, wash it with whites and sugar beat together. Gingerbread Cakes, or Butter and Sugar Gingerbread Number 1. Three pounds of flour, a grated nutmeg, two ounces ginger, one pound sugar, three small spoons pearl ash dissolved in cream, one pound butter, four eggs, knead it stiff, shape it to your fancy, bake fifteen minutes. Soft gingerbread to be baked in pans. Number two. Rub three pounds of sugar, two pounds of butter into four pounds of flour. Add twenty eggs, four ounces ginger, four spoons rose water. Bake as number one. Butter drop. Number three. Rub one quarter of a pound butter, one pound sugar, sprinkled with mace, into one pound and a quarter flour. Add four eggs, one glass rose water. Bake as number one. Gingerbread. Number four. Three pound sugar, half pound butter, quarter of a pound of ginger, one dozen eggs, one glass rose water. Rub into three pounds flour. Bake as number one. A cheap seed cake. Rub one pound sugar, half an ounce allspice into four quarts flour into which pour one pound butter melted in one pint milk, nine eggs, one gill emptins, caraway seed and currants or raisins if you please. Make into two loaves, bake one and half hour. Queen's Cake Whip half pound butter to a cream, add one pound sugar, ten eggs, one glass wine, half gill rose water, and spices to your taste all worked into one and a quarter pound flour. Put into pans, cover with paper, and bake in a quick well-heat oven twelve or sixteen minutes. Pound cake. One pound sugar, one pound butter, one pound flour, one pound or ten eggs. Rose water one gill, spices to your taste. Watch it well, it will bake in a slow oven in fifteen minutes. Another called pound cake. Work three quarters of a pound butter, one pound of good sugar, till very white. Whip ten whites to a foam, add the yolks and beat together. Add one spoon rose water, two of brandy, and put the whole to one and a quarter of a pound flour. If yet too soft, add flour and bake slowly. Soft cakes in little pans. One and a half pound sugar, half pound butter, rubbed into two pounds flour. Add one glass wine, one ditto rose water, eighteen eggs, and a nutmeg. A light cake to bake in small cups. Half a pound sugar, half a pound butter, rubbed into two pounds flour, one glass wine, one ditto rose water, two ditto emptins, a nutmeg, cinnamon, and currants. Shrewsbury cake. One pound butter, three quarters of a pound sugar, a little mace, four eggs mixed and beat with your hand till very light. Put the composition to one pound flour, roll into small cakes, bake with a light oven. N.B. In all cases where spices are named, it is supposed that they be pounded fine and sifted. Sugar must be dried and rolled fine. Flour dried in an oven, eggs well beat or whipped into a raging foam. Diet bread. One pound sugar, nine eggs, beat for an hour. Add to fourteen ounces flour, spoonful rose water, one ditto cinnamon or coriander, bake quick. Rusk to make. Number one. Rub in half pound sugar, half pound butter, to four pound flour. Add pint milk, pint emptins. When risen well, bake in pans ten minutes fast. Number two, one pound sugar, one pound butter, six eggs rubbed into five pounds flour, 
one quart emptins, and wet with milk sufficient to bake as above. Number three, one pound sugar, one pound butter, rubbed into six or eight pounds of flour, twelve eggs, one pint emptins, wet soft with milk and bake. Number four, PC Rusk. Put fifteen eggs to four pounds flour and make into large biscuit, and bake double or one top of another. Number five, one pint milk, one pint emptins, to be laid over night in sponge. In morning, melt three quarters of a pound butter, one pound sugar in another pint of milk, add lukewarm, and beat till it rise well. Number six, three quarters of a pound butter, one pound sugar, twelve eggs, one quart milk, put as much flour as they will wet, a spoon of cinnamon, gill emptins, let it stand till very puffy or light. Roll into small cakes, and let it stand on oiled tins while the oven is heating. Bake fifteen minutes in a quick oven. Then wash the top with sugar and whites while hot. Biscuit. One pound flour, one ounce butter, one egg. Wet with milk and break while oven is heating, and in the same proportion. Butter Biscuit. One pint each, milk and emptins, laid into flour, in sponge. Next morning, add one pound butter melted, not hot, and knead into it as much flour as will, with another pint of warmed milk, be of a sufficient consistence to make soft. Some melt the butter in the milk. A butter drop. Four yolks, two whites, one pound flour, a quarter of a pound butter, one pound sugar, two spoons rose water, a little mace, baked in tin pans. End of Part 5 of American Cookery by Amelia Simmons Part 6 of American Cookery by Amelia Simmons This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Preserves For preserving quinces Take a peck of quinces, pare them, Take out the core with a sharp knife if you wish to have them whole. Boil parings and cores with two pound frost grapes in three quarts water. Boil the liquor an hour and a half, or till it is thick. Strain it through a coarse hair sieve. Add one and a quarter pound sugar to every pound of quince. Put the sugar into the syrup, scald and skim it till it is clear. Put the quinces into the syrup. Cut up two oranges and mix with quince. Hang them over a gentle fire for five hours, then put them in a stone pot for use. Set them in a dry, cool place. For preserving quinces in loaf sugar. Take a peck of quinces, put them into a kettle of cold water, hang them over the fire, boil them till they are soft, then take them out with a fork. When cold, pare them, quarter, or have them, if you like. Take their weight of loaf sugar, Put into a bell metal kettle or saucepan with one quart of water. Scald and skim it till it is very clear. Then put in your quinces. Let them boil in the syrup for half an hour. Add oranges as before if you like. Then put them in stone pots for use. For preserving strawberries. Take two quarts of strawberries, squeeze them through a cloth, add half a pint of water and two pound of sugar. Put it into a saucepan, scald and skim it. Take two pound of strawberries with stems on. Set your saucepan on a chafing dish. Put as many strawberries into the dish as you can with the stems up without bruising them. Let them boil for about ten minutes. Then take them out gently with a fork and put them into a stone pot for use. When you have done the whole, turn the syrup into the pot when hot. Set them in a cool place for use. Currants and cherries may be done in the same way by adding a little more sugar. The American Citron Take the rind of a large watermelon, not too ripe. Cut it into small pieces. Take two pound of loaf sugar, one pint of water. Put it all into a kettle. Let it boil gently for four hours, then put it into pots for use. To keep white bullis pears, plums, or damsons, etc., for tarts or pies. Gather them when full grown, and just as they begin to turn. Pick all the largest out. Save about two-thirds of the fruit. 
To the other third, put as much water as you think will cover them. Boil and skim them. When the fruit is boiled very soft, strain it through a coarse hair sieve, and to every quart of this liquor put a pound and a half of sugar. Boil it and skim it very well. Then throw in your fruit, just give them a scald. Take them off the fire, and when cold, put them into bottles with wide mouths. Pour your syrup over them, lay a piece of white paper over them, and cover them with oil. To make marmalade. To two pounds of quinces, put three quarters of a pound of sugar and a pint of spring water. Then put them over the fire, and boil them till they are tender. Then take them up and bruise them. Then put them into the liquor, let it boil three quarters of an hour, and then put it into your pots or saucers. To preserve mulberries whole. Set some mulberries over the fire in skillet or preserving pan. Draw from them a pint of juice when it is strained. Then take three pounds of sugar beaten very fine. Wet the sugar with the pint of juice. Boil up your sugar and skim it. Put in two pounds of ripe mulberries, and let them stand in the syrup till they are thoroughly warm. Then set them on the fire, and let them boil very gently. Do them but half enough, so put them by in the syrup till next day. Then boil them gently again. When the syrup is pretty thick, and will stand in round drops when it is cold, they are done enough, so put all into a galley-pot for use. To preserve gooseberries, damsons, or plums. Gather them when dry, full-grown, and not ripe. Pick them one by one, put them into glass bottles that are very clean and dry, and cork them close with new corks. Then put a kettle of water on the fire, and put in the bottles with care. Wet not the corks, but let the water come up to the necks. Make a gentle fire till they are a little coddled and turn white. Do not take them up till cold. Then pitch the corks all over, or wax them close and thick. Then set them in a cool, dry cellar. To Preserve Peaches Put your peaches in boiling water. Just give them a scald, but don't let them boil. Take them out and put them in cold water, then dry them in a sieve, and put them in long, wide-mouthed bottles. To half a dozen peaches, take a quarter pound of sugar, clarify it, pour it over your peaches, and fill the bottles with brandy. Stop them close, and keep them in a closed place. To Preserve Apricots Take your apricots and pare them, then stone what you can whole. Give them a light boiling in a pint of water, or according to your quantity of fruit. Then take the weight of your apricots in sugar, and take the liquor which you boil them in, and your sugar, and boil it till it comes to a syrup, and give them a light boiling, taking of the scum as it rises. When the syrup jellies, it is enough. Then take up the apricots, and cover them with the jelly, and put cut paper over them, and lay them down when cold. Or, take you plums before they have stones in them, which you may know by putting a pin through them. Then coddle them in many waters, till they are as green as grass. Peel them and coddle them again. You must take the weight of them in sugar and make a syrup. Put in your sugar a pint of water. Then put them in, set them on the fire to boil slowly, till they be clear, skimming them often, and they will be very green. Put them up in glasses and keep them for use. To Preserve Cherries Take two pounds of cherries, one pound and a half of sugar, half a pint of fair water, melt some sugar in it. When it is melted, put in your other sugar and your cherries, then boil them softly, till all the sugar be melted. Then boil them fast and skim them. Take them off two or three times and shake them, and put them on again, and let them boil fast. And when they are of a good color and the syrup will stand, they are boiled enough. To Preserve Raspberries Choose raspberries that are not too ripe, and take the weight of them in sugar. Wet your sugar with a little water, and put in your berries, and let them boil softly. Take heed of breaking them. When they are clear, take them up, and boil the syrup till it be thick enough. Then put them in again, and when they are cold, put them up in glasses. To Preserve Currants Take the weight of the currants in sugar. Pick out the seeds. Take to a pound of sugar half a pint of water. Let it melt. Then put in your currants, and let them do very leisurely. Skim them, and take them up. Let the syrup boil. 
then put them on again, and when they are clear and the syrup thick enough, take them off, and when they are cold, put them up in glasses. To preserve plums. Take your plums before they have stones in them, which you may know by putting a pin through them. Then coddle them in many waters till they are as green as grass. Peel them and coddle them again. You must take the weight of them in sugar, a pint of water, then put them in, set them on the fire to boil slowly till they be clear, skimming them often, and they will be very green. Put them up in glasses and keep them for use. To keep damsons. Take damsons when they are first ripe, pick them off carefully, wipe them clean, put them into snuff bottles, stop them up tight so that no air can get to them, nor water. Put nothing into the bottles but plums. Put the bottles into cold water, hang them over the fire. Let them heat slowly, let the water boil slowly for half an hour. When the water is cold, take out the bottles. Set the bottles into a cold place. They will keep twelve months if the bottles are stopped tight, so as no air nor water can get to them. They will not keep long after the bottles are opened. The plums must be hard. Current Jelly Having stripped the currants from the stalks, put them in a stone jar, stop it close, set it in a kettle of boiling water halfway the jar, let it boil half an hour, take it out and strain the juice through a coarse hair sieve, to a pint of juice put a pound of sugar, set it over a fine quick fire in a preserving pan or a bell metal skillet, keep stirring it all the time till the sugar be melted, then skim the scum off as fast as it rises. When the jelly is very clear and fine, pour it into earthen or china cups. When cold, cut white papers just the bigness of the top of the pot, and lay on the jelly. Dip those papers in brandy, then cover the top of the pot and prick it full of holes. Set it in a dry place. You may put some into glasses for present use. To dry peaches. Take the fairest and ripest peaches. Pare them into fair water. Take their weight in double refined sugar, of one half makes a very thin syrup. Then put in your peaches, boiling them till they look clear. Then split and stone them, boil them till they are very tender, lay them a-draining, take the other half of the sugar and boil it almost to a candy. Then put in your peaches, and let them lie all night, then lay them on a glass, and set them in a stove till they are dry. If they are sugared too much, wipe them with a wet cloth a little. Let the first syrup be very thin, a quart of water to a pound of sugar. To pickle or make mangoes of melons. Take green melons, as many as you please, and make a brine strong enough to bear an egg. Then pour it boiling hot on the melons, keeping them down under the brine. Let them stand five or six days. Then take them out, split them down on one side, take out all the seeds, scrape them well in the inside, and wash them clean with cold water. Then take a clove of a garlic, a little ginger and nutmeg sliced, and a little whole pepper. Put all these proportionably into the melons, filling them up with mustard seeds. Then lay them in an earthen pot with a slit upwards, and take one part of mustard and two parts of vinegar, enough to cover them, pouring it upon them scalding hot, and keep them close stopped. To Pickle Barberries Take of white wine vinegar and water, of each an equal quantity. To every quart of this liquor, put in half a pound of cheap sugar. Then pick the worst of your barberries, and put into this liquor, and the best into glasses. Then boil your pickle with the worst of your barberries, and skim it very clean. Boil it till it looks of a fine color, then let it stand to be cold before you strain it. Then strain it through a cloth, wringing it to get all the color you can from the barberries. Let it stand to cool and settle, then pour it clear into the glasses. In a little of the pickle, boil a little fennel. When cold, put a little bit at the top of the pot or glass, and cover it close with a bladder or leather. To every half pound of sugar, put a quarter of a pound of white salt. To Pickle Cucumbers Let your cucumbers be small, fresh gathered, and free from spots. Then make a pickle of salt and water, strong enough to bear an egg. Boil the pickle and skim it well, and then pour it upon your cucumbers and stive them down for twenty-four hours. Then strain them out into a colander and dry them well with a cloth, and take the best white wine vinegar with cloves, diced mace, nutmeg, white peppercorns, long pepper, and races of ginger, as much as you please. 
boil them up together, and then clap the cucumbers in with a few vine leaves and a little salt, and as soon as they begin to turn their color, put them into jars. Stive them down close, and when cold, tie on a bladder and leather. Alamode Beef Take a round of beef and stuff it with half pound pork, half pound of butter, the soft of half a loaf of wheat bread, boil four eggs very hard, chop them up, add sweet marjoram, sage, parsley, summer savory, and one ounce of cloves, pounded. Chop them all together with two eggs very fine, and add a gill of wine, season very high with salt and pepper, cut holes in your beef to put your stuffing in, then stick whole cloves into the beef, then put it into a two-pail pot with sticks at the bottom. If you wish to have the beef round when done, put it into a cloth and bind it tight with twenty or thirty yards of twine. Put it into your pot with two or three quarts of water and one gill of wine. If the round be large, it will take three or four hours to bake it. For dressing codfish, put the fish first into cold water and wash it. Then hang it over the fire and soak it six hours in scalding water. Then shift it into clean warm water and let it scald for one hour. It will be much better than to boil. To boil all kinds of garden stuff. In dressing all sorts of kitchen garden herbs, take care they are clean washed, that there be no small snails or caterpillars between the leaves, and that all coarse outer leaves and the tops that have received any injury by the weather be taken off. Next wash them in a good deal of water and put them into a colander to drain. Care must likewise be taken that your pot or saucepan be clean, well tinned, and free from sand or grease. To keep green peas till Christmas. Take young peas, shell them, put them into a colander to drain, then buy a cloth four or five times double on a table, then spread them on. Dry them very well, and have your bottles ready. Fill them, cover them with mutton suet fat when it is a little soft. Fill the necks almost to the top, cork them, tie a bladder and a leather over them, and set them in a dry, cool place. To boil French beans. Take your beans and string them, cut in two and then across. When you have done them all, sprinkle them over with salt, stir them together. As soon as your water boils, put them in and make them boil up quick. They will be soon done, and they will look of a better green than when growing in the garden. If they are very young, only break off the ends, then break in two and dress them in the same manner. To boil broad beans. Beans require a great deal of water, and it is not best to shell them till just before they are ready to go into the pot. When the water boils, put them in with some picked parsley and some salt. Make them boil up quick. When you see them begin to fall, they are done enough. Strain them off, garnish the dish with boiled parsley, and send plain butter in a cup or boat. To boil green peas. When your peas are shelled and the water boils, which should not be much more than will cover them, put them in with a few leaves of mint. As soon as they boil, put in a piece of butter as big as a walnut, and stir them about. When they are done enough, strain them off, and sprinkle in a little salt. Shake them till the water drains off, and send them hot to the table with melted butter in a cup or boat. To boil asparagus. First, cut the white ends off about six inches from the head, and scrape them from the green part downward very clean. As you scrape them, throw them into a pan of clear water, and after a little soaking, tie them up in a small even bundle. When your water boils, put them in and boil them up quick, but by overboiling they will lose their heads. Cut a slice of bread for a toast, and toast it brown on both sides. When your asparagus is done, take it up carefully, dip the toast in the asparagus water, and lay it at the bottom of your dish. Then lay the heads of the asparagus on it, with the white ends outwards. Pour a little melted butter over the heads, cut an orange into small pieces, and stick them between for garnish. To boil cabbage. If your cabbage is large, cut it into quarters. If small, cut it in halves. Let your water boil, then put in a little salt, and next your cabbage with a little more salt upon it. Make your water boil as soon as possible, and when the stalk is tender, take up your cabbage into a colander or sieve, that the water may drain off, and send it to table as hot as you can. Savoys are dressed in the same manner. For brewing spruce beer. Take four ounces of hops, let them boil half an hour in one gallon of water. Strain the hop water, then add sixteen gallons of warm water. 
two gallons of molasses, eight ounces of essence of spruce, dissolved in one quart of water. Put it in a clean cask, then shake it well together. Add half a pint of emptins, then let it stand and work one week. If very warm weather, less time will do. When it is drawn off to bottle, add one spoonful of molasses to every bottle. Emptins Take a handful of hops and about three quarts of water. Let it boil about fifteen minutes, then make a thickening as you do for starch. Strain the liquor. When cold, put a little emptins to work them. They will keep well corked in a bottle five or six weeks. Advertisement the author of the American Cookery, not having an education sufficient to prepare the work for the press, the person that was employed by her, and entrusted with the recipes to prepare them for publication, with a design to impose on her and injure the sale of the book, did omit several articles very essential in some of the recipes, and placed others in their stead, which were highly injurious to them, without her consent, which was unknown to her, till after publication, but she has removed them as far as possible by the following. Errata. Page 25. Rice Pudding, Number 2. For one pound butter, read half pound. For fourteen eggs, read eight. Number 5. After half pint rice, add six ounces sugar. Page 26. A nice Indian pudding, Number 3. Boil only six hours. A flour pudding, read nine spoons of flour. Put in scalding milk. Bake an hour and half. A boiled flour pudding, nine spoons of flour, boil an hour and a half. Page 27. A cream almond pudding. For eight yolks and three whites, read eight eggs. For one spoon flour, read eight. Boil an hour and a half. Potato pudding number one, number two. Add a pint of flour to each. Page 29. Puff pastes for tarts, number three. For twelve eggs, read six. Page 33. Plain Cake. For one quart of emptins, read one pint. Page 35. Another Plain Cake. Number 5. For nine pounds of flour, read eighteen pounds. In all puddings where cream is mentioned, milk may be used. In pastes, the white of eggs only are to be used. End of Part 6. End of American Cookery by Amelia Simmons. Read by Betsy Bush, Marquette, Michigan, July 2010.